Oh. Wow. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for coming. We're going to get started in a minute. Um, how's my, no, we're going to get started in more than one minute. I thought the lights were like, we're getting started. Okay, so so you an economist who became a philosopher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, an advisor. Oh, you're a oh. Yeah, who was your advisor, by the way? AJ Julius. Okay. Yeah, and then. See, we were at UCLA at the same time, and you know, we, we didn't really work there. Although you did come to my office a couple of times, uh, but right. I don't know anyone in philosophy. There. All right, we're about to get started. Um, just briefly to remind people of COVID protocols. Uh, we're not going to be wearing masks while we're speaking, but we'd appreciate if everyone else uh, keeps their masks on, um, including when you're asking questions. And we're going to go about 90 minutes. And because this is a podcast recording, there won't uh, be a Q&A, but I'm sure you can walk up to any of us and Q&A us um, after. <laughs> you can try. Um, <laughs> All right, everyone ready? Yeah. All right. Are we good on the audio and video front? Excellent. Uh, Femi Tyrell, Robin Kelly, and Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Woo! Welcome back to the day. What I've experienced recently as an organizer in Rhode Island, and what I hear from organizers elsewhere, is that the left is demobilized right now because we're demoralized. And of course, like the situation is uneven. There's a real sense of fight back in the workplace. And, but the theme of demoralization can really feel like it carries the day sometimes, especially perhaps on the internet. The three of you have been through a number of periods of ebb and flow on the left, including, I imagine, some really lengthy ebbs. Robin, let's start with you. How, how have you seen the left manage periods of reaction or demobilization in the past? And what, what have you seen organizers get right and wrong? Well, I don't know if I can answer all those questions. Um, but I can say, um, let me begin with the question of the left. Because I'm, um, I'm not sure what the left is. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm old enough to, re to not remember ever there being a single left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in fact, I know there's a lot of fights. Uh, within this thing we call the left, but I, I don't know. You know, I don't know because, of course, the question assumes that there's a singular left. It also assumes that there is a kind of demobilization and demoralization. And let me kind of sort of push back a little bit on that. Yes. One, um, it depends on where you are. If you're in in Florida, you think things are terrible, but then you got this kid who had connections with the Dream Defenders, uh, you know, uh, uh, Maxwell uh, Frost who's running for office and looks like he may win. Now, I'm not saying that running for office is, is, is like the greatest victory on the planet, but in terms of what's being mobilized in a place like that, or the fact that um, the folks who organize the debt collective, they may not be, no one's thrilled with the, the final outcome, but this is a victory. Um, and and the, the folks with the debt collective have been doing this for a long time. I mean, even before Occupy. So in many ways, the ebb and flow is part of the flow of struggle when you don't have power. So I just would expect that, you know, and then a couple other things, you know, um, when we think about the ebb and flow, I wonder how much of that's about visibility. Mm -hmm. um, 2020 blew up, but then all the things that were not, at, well, actually they were pretty visible, to be honest. Uh, all the movement that preceded that, all the organizing that preceded that, um, was there, you know? And it wasn't that it blew up and then it got blown back. It, the, the movement people always there. And in fact, what we're seeing right now is a reaction on the part of the right against those movements because they're not winning. You know, not to say this is about winning, but think about what did they waging war on? They were waging war on queers, communists, women, and wokeness. Mm 
Now, what's wokeness, <laughs> right? Wokeness, that's, that's, that's a racially coded term that refers specifically to those movements. So I'm not saying, in fact, that you're all here, packed in here. Um, the, the, the socialism conferences, a whole lot of young people I've never seen in my life, you know? <laughs> so I, th I actually think there might be some demoralization, there might be some demobilization, but there's a lot of struggle and a lot of mobilization. Um, and the last thing I just say about, about this just has to do with sort of historical context. If we end up talking more about uh, other periods of time, I think about the 1930s uh, and how you know, we think of, we get nostalgic about the 30s, like we get nostalgic about the 60s. And we say the 30s was such a great period of the left mobilizing the Communist Party, and, and that, that is true. Um, but what do we actually get? Uh, we got the New Deal, which is celebrated as somehow a great victory. But what the New Deal did was exactly what Ruthie said last night. It was capitalism, using capitalism to save capitalism. Um, and it was a great victory for capital. Uh, during the Great Depression, um, incomes, income distribution went up to the highest realm. Uh, it didn't go down. Um, during the Great Depression, they, they saved agricultural capital by destroying crops. You know, I mean, they, they shored up the banks. Um, they even created a labor regime, which is partly a product of struggle. I'm not going to deny that. But the labor regime that was produced made it more possible for capital to reproduce itself. Um, and I'm not saying that there were no, no victories, there were, but what I'm saying is that sometimes we have to see struggle dialectically as opposed to like highs and lows. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes what looks like the high is actually in defeat. What looks like the low is movements emerging. Mm -hmm. That's my answer, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me let me pick up where Robin left off, and I'm thinking of a couple of other periods. Um, Robin is the historian at the table, but I have um, had to, as all of us have had to do, study history in order to figure out what to do today. So one example of um, you know a huge flowering of well-reported. Um, activity was the so-called Arab Spring, which is to say the uprisings in North Africa and West Asia in 2010-2011. And of course, those uprisings, which spanned a number of different countries, uh, a number of different regimes, a number of different local and regional issues, um, were the result of not only spontaneous eruptions in the streets and the squares, but also years and years and years and years of organizing on the part of agricultural workers, labor unions, anti-militarism -militari people, um, anti-patriarchy um, uh, uh, organizing, and so on and so forth. So all of those things came together at that time and erupted. Similarly, um, and this is a little more abstract, but something I've been noodling on quite a bit lately, is the, um, the look of global, and I mean global, foreign direct investment in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And how if we look at the, at the arc of you know, rise in foreign di direct investment and then crashes, there's this period between the mid-1950s and the late 1960s that we sometimes call the Great Compression. And it's a time when there was the least volatility. It's also the time here in the United States when income inequality was at its lowest, which doesn't mean there weren't poor people, but um, the range was at its lowest. And I attribute that great compression on a global and more local scale to the kinds of anti-colonial, anti-racist, pro-socialist and pro-communist organizing that was happening all over the world. Right. So there are, you know, a lots, lots of themes and indications that we can use to try to give ourselves some guidance for the future in thinking about the sorts of internationalism that made certain things possible, the ways in which elite capture takes um, radical activity and pacifies it and domesticates it and so forth. Thank you. 
I don't have too much to add, um, but I will say one thing. Um, I think if you were out there in summer 2020 and you faced down the tear gas and you faced down the cops, right, and you saw a police station burning, I think, you know, it would be easy to think we're storming the Bastille right now. Like, right. tomorrow, right, 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 things right. are going to get real, right. you know? And, and not at all to knock what did happen, but obviously we, we, one thing that we do know for sure is that that wasn't, you know, the day after wasn't the dissolution of this global empire or of the system of racial capital, right? It was just another movement, another moment in struggle. Um, and I think one of the things that we, that it makes sense to take away from this historical perspective, from this dialectical perspective on history, is that, you know, how we respond to these moments isn't necessarily going to be something that we can understand until years later, right? Um, I understand the frustration of somebody who thought that there, you know, mass movement in the streets was going to turn into mass membership in large organize, organizations and sustained mass politics. Unfortunately, that isn't what happened, but at the same time, a thing that we can remember and the thing that we will start to understand and build the kind of movement level memory of is that these exciting moments aren't the end of the story, right? They might be, as Robin was saying before, they might be you know, just another step on the road to wherever it is that we're going. Yeah, I, I wanna follow up on, on just that. I think today we're very much witnessing in many ways the afterlives of like two big movements of 2020. First, the Bernie campaign and then the summer of uh, mass George Floyd mm -hmm. uprising in the streets. And both movements sort of narrowly, in a, in a more narrowly conceived way, failed at achieving their most straightforward objective. Like police by and large were not defunded and Bernie was not elected president. But I think, for example, in the current resurgence of labor militancy, especially among young workers at Amazon, Starbucks, Trader Joe's, th those workers, at least the leaders, but I would say probably most were in the streets that summer and were voting for Bernie or organizing for Bernie in the primary. So how do you all read that history, the legacy of those pivotal electoral and then street movements of what they've combined to create? And maybe more broadly, how should we evaluate the successes and limits of social movements? Is it enough to talk about policy wins? Uh, the, the, the emergence of new organizations seems like one key benchmark, but but how do we assess these harder to grasp shifts in attitudes, consciousness, subjectivity that, that movements like those of 2020 can produce? Mm -hmm. I have lots of thoughts about this and none of it's about Bernie. Um, but I'll talk about what I think about and you guys can talk about Bernie if you want to. Um, <laughs> and I got nothing against Bernie, he's great, you know. But, but, um, but the, the I want to talk about the resurgence of labor militancy mm -hmm. and labor organizing, and I think it's a key thing, and it gives me more hope than almost anything. Um, and, it's, and it's because of the obvious thing that many of us forget in the day-to-day -day of struggle, and that is when you're doing something with somebody else, it's better, right? Well, that's what we learned from Mariam Kaba, right? Anything worth doing, you do with somebody else. It's better. And labor unions, whether they're already existing unions or new formations that use the kind of structures of such institutions, make uh, a necessary concentration of energy and enthusiasm. And the kind of thing that people have managed to achieve using that work, this is something that Robin's written about brilliantly, um, is a sort of solidarity and trajectory, energy 
energetic trajectory toward the future mm -hmm. that makes possible doing more things. This is why I was saying last night that abolition is that. It doesn't matter if anybody in the Amazon um, union thinks of themselves as abolitionists. That is part of what abolition requires in order to change everything. Um, it's one example of many. I also want to say one other thing, which is that as far as I can tell over my very long life, there are two ways to work with people in organizations. You can innovate them, which some people do, or you can infiltrate what is. Mm -hmm. And infiltration is a really good thing because a lot of the you know, resources are there and available, and by going through an inter in internal democratic process, it's possible to seize resources, and that's the point, isn't it? In order to change the world. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll be even briefer um, because I think Ruthie said everything needs to be said. Um, one thing I would add to that, and, and it's interesting, you know, sitting next to Ruthie, we're, we were just talking, you know, before we actually had this conversation about, um, about the language of abolition and how, you know, even if you don't measure, you know, again, I, I have this whole issue with success and how you measure, and I think it's, just, it's, I think it's a useful way of, of thinking, of, of trying to come up with the measure. But I do think that, you know, people say abolition in a way that they were not saying it 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the, that, so what we're looking at to sort of think about Gramsci is a kind of, this is like a war of position, right? Mm -hmm. um, this, is a, a, um, this is a way of, of, of sort of challenging the hegemony of what is natural. There was a time in my lifetime when <laughs> there was a struggle to try to improve the conditions of prisoners. I mean, that was it. That's where it ended. Um, and the idea that you basically abolish prisons, abolish police, I'm not saying it's new, 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 but it certainly has become more pervasive. And that's all the organizing work. But it's not just organizing work in the streets. It's also the intellectual work. Mm -hmm. It's also the, you know, all that's tied together. So I think what we're witnessing is a shift in perspective, which, you know, even if it doesn't manifest itself in a concrete policy shift at the moment, that shift in perspective is the most dangerous thing you have, mm -hmm. you know? Because there will be people, organizers, labor organizers, who will use the term abolitionist. Um, and, ab and ironically, the, 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 the um, surge, I'm gonna say resurgence, but the surge of abolition, the language of abolition, has actually, I think, lent itself to the surge or the resurgence of socialism mm -hmm. as a concept. Totally. I think that there are not quite, you know, there are things we can count, right? If we want to figure out how we're doing. And I was thinking about this in response to the first question where, you know, part of what is maybe demoralizing or demobilizing for some, especially people who are involved, is, you know, the gap between what we win and what we want is. Um, but I think it takes a long time to win at scale and something we can count in the meantime is just numbers of fighters, right? At our membership meetings, compared to last year, are there more or fewer people? Um, I was at uh, the eco-socialism panel this morning, and they were talking about how you know, they had three times as many people make phone calls pressuring the New York state government um, to pass build public renewables as there were people who had been officially on paper organized by that. Uh, group of people. So I think the number of people participating in struggle, whether or not there is an immediate win that happens today, um, I think that's the kind of indicator that we should look at. And if you look at at least some of the numbers, uh, how many applications there are to the NLRB for new unions, like that tells a story of, of um, flow rather than ebb. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's that's the story. Mm -hmm. 
what does it reveal about the, the balance of power in society that these mass mobilizations for all that they have accomplished were so often metabolized by, by liberal forms of identity politics that emphasized representation and recognition above all else. The 2020 movement, without a doubt, had stronger antibodies against that than prior iterations with the clear materialist demand to defund the police that strikes like right at the heart of the cross-cultural state, but in corporate America and media and academia, and academia, it was all often, too often, quickly metabolized as a matter of diversity, representation, whatever. What, Femi, how do anti-racist radical struggles navigate this gargantuan force of American liberalism? And, and what did we learn about that <laughs> <laughs> over the past few years? <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do how do we take on liberalism? Oh boy, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I don't know. I mean, I have to think about what to say on the prescriptive side of here's what we should do. Um, but actually, the thing that occurs to me to say is to just point out, here's what we have done. Because I, um, for those of you who don't know, my, my day job is a philosopher. <laughs> Let me tell you what they were talking about <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> right? Is the hole in the center of a donut, is that an object? <laughs> right? Wait, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Theories and bounds. You know? <laughs> and now they're talking about, well, you know, should we have epistemic justice? Um, should our syllabi include this or that? And one response to that is to point out the big gulf between that and material, you know, material gains and the reconstruction of the economy around public ownership. And those are things that, of course, the socialists were going to point out. But the other thing that we should point out is that the very move to representation constantly in the face of burning police stations, you know, exactly as Robin said a couple questions ago, is something that looks from one perspective to be uh, you know, some kind of defeat for us, but I think in the longer view demonstrates the power that we're building. Um, it is a show of weakness on the side of liberalism that they have nothing to say for themselves other than here's Herschel Walker. <laughs> right. And so, you know, I don't have much to say other than let's keep doing what we've been doing. Exactly, exactly. Really? Yeah, I mean, I, one of the things I've thought about a lot is how um, quickly, and Femi wrote a whole book about this, it's called Liberal Capture, you should all read it. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but how quickly um, something that is um, uh, complicated and powerful and possibly symbolic of liberation can be turned against itself. But we have to think always about the dialectics of everything in order to do anything. But it's very, very quick. And what helps me is to look outside the United States for a second, mm -hmm. because the US liberal bubble is an astonishingly mind-numbing thing. <laughs> right? The US liberal bubble in which you know, the extent of evil is named Donald Trump, rather than the entire system right. that right. enabled right. Donald right. Trump to be. Right. Um, and so looking at what a social movement that's been around for, for, for 40 years does, the MST, and the constant evolution and expansion of the work that they do reminds me what we can do here. Um, uh, and in fact, what, it reminds me what we must do here. I was thinking that if, if you'll allow, perspective is a powerful word, but I would like us to think with the word consciousness. Mm -hmm. And to think about the kinds of consciousness um, that people were and are 
developing as a result of the uprisings of the 20s and the campaign for Bernie Sanders in, in, 1920, in 2020. That, <laughs> 1920. He is, he's old. Yeah, he is old. <laughs> he, he wasn't born in 1920. In 2020, the, the uprisings and, and all that electoral uh, campaigning mm -hmm. stuff, and think about how people's consciousnesses of what is possible right. have changed, right? It's not just perspective. It's, it's open, and yet the openness is not itself fixed. And this is where having gatherings like this, the socialism conference, is so important. Not to fill people's, you know, gaps in people's minds with some content, mm -hmm. but to give us the opportunity to have these conversations and have some debates so we go back to our day jobs considering the donut or organizing <laughs> the, the teachers, right. you know, with some new, you know, let me quote myself, creative aggression right. in hand. Right, right. Oh, no, no, I, I'm not. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> I, I agree. Uh, speaking of, of age, um, we have, I think, two old millennials on the panel and two boomers. Are you a boomer? I don't, th I don't think. I, I, don't I don't think, think so. I mean, you don't have to say. It. Well, okay. <laughs> no, no, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will say. I, 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 don't, I don't think I'm a. I don't think I'm a boomer. I, when were um, you a boomer? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a you know, early bloomer. <laughs> um, but no, I was born in 1962. Oh, you're so I'm a member of ARP. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, yeah, you're a boomer. Yeah. You're the, the last of I'm the boomers. I'm the last, the last, the of, last the of the boomers. I was right. the high point of the boomers. <laughs> <laughs> the pinnacle. The pinnacle. I, uh, yeah, despite my uh, you know, relative youth, I'm often the <laughs> oldest person in the room in many organizing meetings at age 39, and by contrast, whenever I check, check in on what exists in the anti-war movement, it is like all kind of boomers from the peace movement of the 60s who are kind of stuck, valiantly stuck around. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what sort of structures do we have in place to transmit knowledge across time mm -hmm. on the left? And, and what political organizations did you all come up in, and did they have strong ties to previous generations right. of left politics? Um, I guess I'll, I'll start with that one. On, on the first one, what kinds of structures? Who boy. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a very complicated thing. I, I mean, in my, my political biography sort of reveals the story about, about why sometimes you don't really want to have a direct line and why sometimes a problem, and why sometimes uh, that kind of intergenerational mentorship is important. Um, so for me, you know, I came, you know, my sister was my mentor, Makani Temba. And she, she raised me politically, she continues to raise me. And so I got, I became a communist through her as a member of the Communist Workers Party. When the Black Radical Congress was formed here in 1998, uh, with a bunch of people, some people are here in the room, um, so it's two different stories. One is with the Communist Workers Party, it was very intergenerational, and we learned a lot from people who are older comrades. I remember I was part of a study group of all workers, both uh, health workers and workers in San Pedro back when they had actually factories, and there was a lot more industrial work. And I was in a study group of reading Mao and, and reading Marx with older activists, many of whom were involved in black power, civil rights, and learned a lot from them and from their example and from their discipline. Um, when I was in college, my professor, uh, Jack Stewart, he says, oh, you know, um, uh, I have a group you can hang out with. It was a, um, it was a study group for the Peace and Freedom Party. And some of you may have heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> but the Peace and Freedom, it was, so I show up and I was not only the only black person in the room, but I was the only one under 70. <laughs> and I was 18 years old. And it was like the most amazing thing. On the other hand, we get to the Black Radical Congress, and the other story is when um, uh, around the same time of the Black Radical Congress was the labor teach-ins. Some of you may remember this in 1995 through uh, where 
there's a group called Sausage, scholars and, art, and artists and writers for social justice supporting labor. And they asked, they, they needed a black person, so they brought me in. I, <laughs> I gave a speech at one of the sessions and I said something about, you know, you can't let all these old people run your organization. You've got to, you've got to take leadership. And Eric Altman had a fit and t attacked me in the nation for that. Wow. Oh, yeah, he, he, I'll call him out in a second. Please. Faker. Wow, it's a faker. Um, so then to go back to Black Radical Congress, the same thing. The Black Radical Congress emerges as this powerful organization. And it is, it is, I still have nothing but love for the organization. But I remember they created a youth sort of division, a kind of youth caucus. But the youth caucus was like 30 and younger. And I remember saying, saying, you know what? This should not be a youth caucus. SNCC didn't have a youth caucus. Mm -hmm. you know, in other words, you can test, you, the leadership should be those people who are 16, 17, 18, alongside the others. In other words, sometimes this idea of passing the torch or mentorship can be very powerful, and sometimes it can be a problem because it does, because there are times when there's intergenerational difference that matters, mm -hmm. where younger people actually have a perspective, a consciousness that is probably, for whatever limits and faults, maybe more radical than what other people want. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'm not one, I, I, I don't see a problem um, in terms of the ability of intergenerational organizing and building. The problem to me is not intergenerational. Even, even um, Ferguson, one of the biggest myths about Ferguson was that it was just like these young people who were saying, you know, this is not your grandparents' civil rights movement, and all the older people were, uh, were out. That's not true. I went to some of those meetings, and there are people across generations in the same room, you know? I mean, so there, there's, it, it exists it's connected, to me the problem is not intergenerational. Some of the problem is, is the fact that we live in a social media universe where people could hide behind their blogs and have no connection to other people doing things together. Mm -hmm. Of any age. You know, of any age. Mm -hmm. And to me that's much more of a challenge than the question of how do you pass this on because I feel like we learn stuff all the time from the kind of experimental uh, even the missteps and mistakes that people make when they're organizing and struggling. And that, those are the lessons that are so valuable, they're gold, you know? And so we have to always learn, and we can't always be the ones to, to have the knowledge to pass on. And I'm not saying this, that we don't have anything useful to, to give, but I'm saying it's a much more give and take. And that's what I've always seen in the movement spaces I've been in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I was raised in a family of organizers. My dad uh, organized labor unions and then was a community organizer and did a lot of amazing things. And I've you know, written about him a little bit, so you probably all know a little something about my dad if you've read anything I've written. His father was a labor organizer, you know, a long line of organizers who are also what we used to call in the middle of the 20th century race people, right? So we, we worked. Uh, constantly to free ourselves. I grew up in the North. I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, a working class uh, neighborhood in a town, you know, dominated by two things, Yale University and also the Winchester Repeating Rifle Company, right? So warfare and the intellectuals who decide on whom to make the war, <laughs> basically. Um, so intergenerational was the given. You know, I went to meetings with my parents and sat in the back of the meeting and folded things and put them in envelopes and all of that. When I was a little bit older, started college, I joined, I'm embarrassed to tell you, so I won't, I joined a small communist tendency that turned out to be kind of real ridiculous, except for I did get, in a good way, somewhat disciplined by it. Um, and then, you know, continued organizing in a variety of ways. The point, the key word here is organize. Mm -hmm. But, but as, as I think you were suggesting, Robin, and you were definitely um, arguing, Femi, uh, 
the key word is organizing, but it's not organizing according to some kind of blueprint. It's like thinking, studying, learning, trying something new. St thinking, studying, learning, trying something new. So maybe I'll kind of sum at this point by saying uh, that as a teacher, I've been a profess professional professor for 25 years of my 72 years. Um, as a teacher, I have found that the kinds of students I have the most fun teaching, I really enjoy, are artists, athletes, and engineers. <laughs> artists and athletes know that practice makes different. Mm -hmm. They all know it. You do something, you do something else. And engineers have no fear about thinking about systems and structures. That's what's given for them. Mm -hmm. So you can talk to an engineer about how racial capitalism works, and they go, yeah, I got it. Like, what's the mystery? <laughs> um, both, uh, both what um, Ruthie and Robin just said really resonate with me. I think the way that it, the way that's coming to mind is, you know, there needs to be access to intergenerational knowledge, but, but how that access is there really matters, mm -hmm. right? So it's in the form of an organization where the elders control you know, our imagination and our political actions, or is it just, um, or are there spaces where the knowledge that previous generations of struggle have had can be transmitted to us, not necessarily in orthodox or doctrinaire ways, but just available so we don't have to reinvent wheels, so we can draw on it for creative ideas, all those sorts of things. And, you know, one of the things that I think is, you know, that people on the left have been rightly pointing out about the movement by the right against CRT is that one of the, one of the things it's trying to do is prevent organizers from being creative, right? I think that, is, that has long been one of the goals of the right for dismantling public education. It's no coincidence that the um, student protests that created things like black studies and cultural studies happened at a time when the class composition of um, public education in the University of California system was more working class, yeah. right? When higher, when higher education was more available to people who could use it to figure out why capitalism was messing up their lives. I think that, you know, even, even to leave the system view for a second and just go to my own experience, it's no accident that I developed the politics that I did, you know, being at being in the UC system, which had lots of black studies and labor studies people. It's no accident that I developed the politics that I did being a part of my graduate workers union. Mm -hmm. You know, it's no accident that I developed the politics that I did, you know, I wasn't personally a student of Robbins, but a lot of my comrades were. And that information that you know, Robin, Robin's generation, Ruthie, Ruthie's generation built in cultural studies. That was originally the point of having cultural studies, right? We were going to develop the kind of information we, you know, we needed to analyze race, racial capitalism, and make it available to the generations of people who were at the age of learning. And so, you know, I think if, we think about it in this space kind of way, um, rather than necessarily direct relationships from mentor to mentee. Um, it's 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 clear what kind of things that we need to have intergenerational, um, to have good intergenerational transmission of information. There are things like labor centers and mm -hmm. education that doesn't exclude race and labor history and so on and so forth. Well, one major generational that I've noticed that on the left is that younger socialists tend to emphasize their opposition to the democratic establishment and liberals more, whereas for older people on the left, there tends to, though of course not always, 
be a stronger emphasis on fighting an increasingly authoritarian right. Something I've seen from Adolf Fried, Max Albaum, many others. Mm -hmm. How do you all think about threading that needle? How, how should the left's fight against a radicalizing right relate to our struggle with liberals, centrists, and whatnot? Man. <laughs> Change Everything is, I believe, the title of this conference. <laughs> um, and and it's, a, it's a good question. Um, here's what I think. I think that uh, the tendency in the United States today is toward fascism. Um, and in some places, and we were discussing earlier today in a fantastic session that Naomi Murakawa um, uh, spoke at, um, well, it was her work, the whole session. Um, it's, it's very rapid, it, uh, spatially uneven, so more rapid and, and intense perhaps in Florida and Texas, but like 33 states at least are uh, instituting a whole lot of lawmaking and requirements of um, uh, policing of the sort that I was talking about last night, whether waged or unwaged, policing expectations on the part of people who work allegedly to provide public goods for public use. Um, that this tendency toward fascism means that both um, those who are looking at the, who are focusing on the authoritarian right and those who are fighting against the democratic establishment should easily recognize they're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the democratic establishment, which is an establishment to maintain a certain chunk of um, capitalism uh, intact, is going to constantly yield to the authoritarians in order to maintain the most important thing that they are the political wing of, and that is capitalism. Right. Right? So I think, I think in the United States today, um, and in, in a good deal of the world, to go back to Gramsci, I'm not altogether sure there is any hegemonic anything. All there is is domination. Mm -hmm. And that, that this descent from hegemony to domination means, one, everything is up for struggle, that's a good thing, but two, the resolution tendencies seem to be going in the direction constantly of fascism. Mm -hmm. That's where we're at. And I think that's one of the reasons there are a thousand people at this conference. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. And let me just add that, one, we have to remember, um, well, liberalism gave us nothing. <laughs> There's nothing. I mean, that's why I, wa I wonder about the generations. I know there are some people who are basically kind of in bed with the Democratic Party and liberals there, but they were classical liberals from before. They, they pretended to be leftists, um, but they were liberal. I mean, I won't even name them. People get invited to the White House or whatnot. So um, I'm not even going to name them. But when you think about what it means, the, the earlier generations, the anti-war generations, who were they fighting? They, they, weren't fi they were fighting the right, of course they were, but they were mostly fighting the Johnson administration. Much of the radicalism that we always attribute to like the 60s, it was against a liberal regime, the liberal regime that gave us a war on poverty that, that didn't even address poverty, right? A liberal regime that in, in, in place of a war on poverty, we got, you know, as, as Liz Sinton's book talks about, got a war on crime, a war on drugs, we got war, war, war. You know, when we think about the 1990s, so many of those struggles, I write about this in, in the new issue, of, new edition of Freedom Dreams, but also the original edition of Freedom Dreams. So many of those fights were against a liberal regime, against the Clinton era. So it's only the fake nostalgia of thinking about those as the glory days that makes us forget that I don't remember a generation of activists who were not fighting liberals. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't even know if that ever happened, mm -hmm. that they were not, and fighting the right. You know, and what you're saying is so right. If you even look at the history of fascism in Europe, it's the liberal regimes that seed to fascism. You know, there's no right to right. There's no, the fascists did not overthrow the liberal regimes. They emerged out of them. 
-hmm. you know? And right after fascism was formally defeated, what did those regimes do? They continued fascism in the colonies, mm -hmm. right? That's what they do. So there's the, the distinction between these things are not so sharp, and I think we have to be real careful when we're saying, well, if we can just uphold this liberal regime and silence ourselves, that we actually could, could beat back fascism. That's not how you beat back fascism. You have to fight on all those fronts, as, as Ruthie's saying, you know, anyway. I would. That's, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the American left is often criticized for not being internationalist enough, and, and that's fair. I mean, just look at the lack of any sort of sustained or broad response to Biden recently stealing half of Afghanistan's central bank reserves for 9-11 families. Mm -hmm. but, but what should that internationalism look like and, and, where, and where did it go? Did, did it disappear along with the Cold War and the era of national liberation movements? Because I, I sometimes have the sense that the answer, what the material practice, what the material practice of solidarity should look like, was once a bit more obvious. Thinking back to the 80s and the Central American Solidarity Movement, which was both supporting Central American revolutions, defend opposing Reagan's dirty wars, and also defending refugees when they arrived here in the U.S. Do, do any positive examples come to mind today, looking at Palestine, climate, the war on terror, immigrant rights, and how should we be not just thinking but doing internationalism? I like, I like reparations. Um, I, you know, I think it's a very long-term Aspects of internationalism have to be long-term because they just depend on having a certain kind of, they, they depend on having enough power to actually ch challenge the foreign policy establishment, which as parts of the state go, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the part of the state that was robust against the Vietnam era anti-war movement, which is among the largest social movements we've ever seen in this country's history, just to talk about an international movement in the United States. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, people who aren't of the opinion that they can organize to defend their own children are going to be very difficult to organize to defend anyone else's. Like, I, I just think that is the starting point for a realistic political analysis of uh, internationalism. Um, but I don't think that we, I don't think that it's just political education until we have, you know, triple our union density. Right? There are things that um, can be done and are being done. UTLA, for example, um, when it was negotiating, negotiated for um, an immigration legal defense fund, you know, um, that's part of the bargaining for the common good movement, which is linking contract demands to larger justice-oriented demands. And I think that kind of organizing in general is the sort of thing that is more compatible with internationalism than, than um, kind of standard status quo politics. So I do, I do think even between now and a much more organized US working class, there are things to do internationally. But I do think the basic problem is you know, a base building one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I also think that there is a fair amount of, you know, however modestly scaled, internationalism from below that is happening all the time. You know, sanctuary, um, uh, city uh, organizing, organizing to protect people who are undocumented, organizing, to um, help people cross borders. Uh, a lot of this work is going on. I also think that, to go back to our um, comrades who are organizing unions, that so many unions, however local their local fight is, are entailed by firms or capitalist activities that necessarily, by definition, have an inch, a, a global reach, which means that there is the possibility for internationalism built into the union struggle. Mm 
So whether that's Amazon workers who are moving things that have, you know, in those cardboard boxes with the smile on it, um, you know, pieces of Congo and, you know, the blood of a Bangladeshi worker and, and a piece of Chile, you know, mm -hmm. in every box. Mm -hmm. um, or um, uh, other workers, uh, I talked a little bit last night about the nurses, the National Nurses United has uh, organized with some nurses unions in a number of countries to form a global Nurses United uh, front. And they're organizing in big places like Brazil and India and so forth. So this is another aspect of internationalism that is not quite from below, but pretty close to from, from below. And I think there, there are many more examples of what we can see. Now, does something called the left recognize this? I don't know, because to go back to what Robin was saying, I'm not altogether sure, Dan, sometimes what or who the left is. <laughs> That, right. That is a that is a question I'm going to ask later. <laughs> yeah, can, can I follow? Because yeah, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> I, I just I just want to to affirm, um, well, what both Femi and Ruthie said, but in particular, I I guess for me I I see a lot of internationalism, but it takes on different forms. Takes on exactly the forms you just laid out. Mm -hmm. um, the the fact of the matter is that almost all those movements that just erupted. Uh, in spring 2020 that existed before that, that made spring 2020 happen, whether you're talking about the Dream Defenders or Recharge Genocide or Black Lives Matter, or, you know, um, they, they, are, they, were, they were insistently internationalist. Mm -hmm. But we, we don't think, you know, that's where the left is, those folks. The, the, it, um, I don't know more. You know, the struggles around... Um, uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline. These are internationalist, indigenous struggles. They're so internationalist, extremely internationalist. They're there. I mean, who's going to Palestine? You got so many people going to Palestine. I keep running into people in Palestine who are like in the streets of Chicago, but or in, in, in Miami or in Philadelphia, right? So it's there. I don't know who the I don't like. I don't know who the left is, and I do know that what we do suffer from is a long-standing. Um, history of white nationalism, which is not a minority position. It's something that's common to the United States. And so the fact that there is not a robust, vibrant, angry, anti-war movement pushing back against the United States saber rattling in China, uh, and, and for that matter, Russia, the fact that it's not there and the fact that there's a U.S. foreign policy that still um, believes that the American empire is, they're not even hiding it. It's like not only righteous, but it's normative. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fact that this exists is, to me, the problem. I, I, but then again, you know, our movements have never been majority movements. I know we always talk about scale, 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 and I, I think scale is important. But even if you think of the civil rights movement, it was never a mass, mass movement. You know, you have mass moments. Mm -hmm. But what SNCC was doing on the ground, it was small numbers. So I think that the internationalism, one could argue that internationalism among those movements that are movement movements is more robust now mm -hmm. than in a long time. I would, I would say that. Ruthie, do you, do you think that left internationalism, American left internationalism today is as robust as it was during the heyday of, of third worldism? And, and national liberation struggles? Um. That's a trick question. It is a trick question. Maybe I'll redirect it to Robin. So I want to oh, no, back. no, no. <laughs> you should ask, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of a I'm trick not, question. I'm, well, I'm not, con I, I'm not convinced. I, I, I agree that it, it, we see it in, in places where it might not be immediately obvious and that it's mm -hmm. maybe more robust than it might appear at first blush. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not convinced mm -hmm. that it's as robust as it was then. Well, here, maybe, maybe here, the best thing I can do is ask you, Dan, to say what you think you mean by mm -hmm. internationalism. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's yeah. what we're stumbling over. I think there was a concrete practice, specific, specifically in the Central America Solidarity mm -hmm. Movement, um, the elders of which are sort of the, were my mentors coming up in the late 90s. And, early aughts that was perhaps possible because of 
geographic proximity between Central America and the United States, where you had a lot of movement back and forth across borders. Um, and you had this amazing dynamic connecting the political struggle against US in intervention in Central America, the active support for the revolutionary movements mm -hmm. in Central America to this, this more politically broader base that brought in, that was kind of anchored on the left, but brought in a lot of, a lot of liberals and more kind of mainstream nonprofits too of defending refugee rights once they crossed the border. Um, and that created um, a, a sort of visibility and of the transnationality of the struggle right. that I think was notable. Well, and same with the anti apartheid Ruth, Ruth and I came up in that. We yes. were in California at the same time. <laughs> yeah. We were in California in the 80s. Mm -hmm. There's, that, that was one of the hubs of this, the um, sanctuary movement. And anyone on the left, they were all working. We were listening to Blaise Bompain on the raid on, on KPFK. Yeah. We were all organized mm -hmm. around this whole question. So that's not even, that's definitely the fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, you can go back, because I thought you meant the 70s. Yeah. The, the, the days of the African Liberation Support right. Committee, the mm -hmm. days right. of where the struggles on Angola, Guinea Bissau. And, sure. I mean, in other words, there's a long tradition and history of internationalism that, that ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, but there's a difference. I'm not. But if we're, if, if if the question is, was there a this unified thing called the American Left that was moving in that direction more so than today? The the way the what I, the reason I would sort of question it is not that there's more. Um, I certainly think it's more complicated, but there's a lot going on in the '70s and '80s. Um, what I would say is different, though, is that some of those movements were not necessarily identified with what someone who's a historian of the left would identify as the left. Exactly. <laughs> and I would, I would say there's left, but, but they're not, they don't get, I, I wrote Freedom Dreams to make the point that there's a whole left that you don't think is a left. And here it is, you know? So I, 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 think, um, I think that's a, a real important part of the story because that's the anti-apartheid movement the struggles to to to, um, to basically defund all the to, to boycott the banks and industries that are putting money in Angola and Southern Africa and that sort of thing, those are big, robust movements, often led by people who the left disputed or considered not really part of their circle. Can I, can I push back though? So, so you, I want to ask the question based on on how you think about the left, right? Because I'm also thinking about that same kind of historical trajectory, right? You had people supporting African liberation fighters throughout the US, you know, putting them on, mm -hmm. you know, tours and, you know, making all these networks and uh, supporting anti-apartheid struggles um, and not just intervening in terms of developing politically in an internationalist direction, but actually trying to destroy apartheid, right? right? Mm -hmm. Actually trying to stop the Vietnam right. War, actually trying to stop Iraq, Afghanistan invasions. Um, and that is a level of internationalist organizing. So do you think we're still at that level now in, you know, in the broader version of the left or the different version of the left? If I could add a quick addendum, I would think the examples of the anti-Iraq and anti-Afghanistan war movements might point more towards the shift towards the, 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 the deep decline of internationalism, because mm -hmm. there was a huge explosion of anti-war protests in the mid and early aughts, but it was not a sustained, did not add up to a sustained mass attempt to stop the war in the sense that there was a sustained mass attempt to destroy apartheid or stop Reagan's dirty wars in Central America. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I want... Ruthie has a better answer than I do. <laughs> I, I, I just, all I'll say is that it just it really does depend because there's some moments like Grenada. Mm -hmm. Grenada is very important because whatever the limits and, and pitfalls of New Jewel movement, a lot of people who died in Grenada who had to flee were from here. And they moved there to be part of that revolution. You know? And I'm not trying to, to say that there's like a hierarchy of internationalism. I'm saying that what you're describing, which I think is really important, that is what it means to invest 
in a movement to try to end this colonial order. And that's like a really good example of, of people participating in revolution. And I don't, I, I just think it depends on time, place, condition. Right now, a lot of people are taking a stand in, with respect to Palestine in a way, and Ruthie was one of the, among that early generation that went there and was you know, in solidarity, um, and, and, and suffering as a result of that. You know? um, and there are more people now, I think, than say 20 years ago in terms of the US support for Palestine. So it just depends. Like it goes up, back and forth, up and down. And I think each, each, each thing has to be looked at in terms of time, space, condition, um, as opposed to just seeing a, because uh, the world is uneven, if that makes sense. I don't know. It's really uneven. Yeah, this is what we geographers talk about all the time. <laughs> uneven, <laughs> uneven, uneven development. Well, here, here's, here's the one thing I think I can add to our conversation right now. Um, uh, Robin, you did write a book, Freedom Dreams, to teach or remind people there is, um, in your book, and therefore in a good deal of the world not covered by your book or Femi's mm -hmm. book and my book, uh, all of this activity mm -hmm. that is left activity that doesn't count in many mm -hmm. people's estimation when they think about the left. Here are two things that I thought about while we were talking. The first is that a lot of the organizational energy and commitment that went into um, people uh, joining forces to, uh, in, in the US to end apartheid in Southern Africa, support the frontline states, all that stuff. Um, uh, so much of the energy that went into CISPUS and, and a lot of the Central American struggles, uh, of course the energy that went into um, uh, trying to end the wars in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. A lot of that energy, you know, arose, it consolidated, it consolidated at the same time as many of the U.S.-based um, radical domestic struggles, whether SNCC, Black Panther Party, and so forth. As we know, the Panther Party was slammed into the ground, right. slammed into the ground, murdered into oblivion, mm -hmm. and then people who weren't murdered were sent to jail right. and are still there, by and large. Right. But the organizational energy and capacity didn't all go away. And what happened to a lot of it is that it went, as it were, underground. And I don't mean necessarily clandestinely mm -hmm. underground, but it just faded from sight, faded from vision, but people kept doing things. Mm -hmm. The contemporary abolition movement that a bunch of us kicked off in the late 90s is the direct um, product of that work mm -hmm. by those people who kept organizing, who kept organizing. And so when we got to that turning point that Robin described earlier about how once upon a time the um, uh, anti-prison movement was only concerned with making the well-being of prisoners more secure mm -hmm. while in prison, mm -hmm. right? That turned into abolition mm -hmm. when we realized the only way to guarantee the well-being of prisoners is to get them out of prison. Mm -hmm. right. Now, for some people who style themselves, you know, big thinkers on the left today, that is a fool's errand because we are, um, putting our energy and enthusiasm and demands at the service of people who are somehow, in the estimation of these people who are big shots, uh, to, in the service of people who are not worthy of this um, activity because they are marginal to the actual people who are actually the protagonists of history in the struggle against capitalism. We say, from our long experience fighting in the US and fighting internationally, that's bullshit. And that this, the human sacrifice characterized by mass incarceration is part of 
the general global problem of what capitalism does, how it works, and how it destroys people, places, and things. Mm -hmm. And this is why I agreed to come to this conference at all this year, was so that I could talk with people whose, um, whose learning and thinking has been so meaningful to me, new friend, ancient friend. <laughs> oh, for those who are listening to the podcast, new friend is Femi, ancient friend is Robin. <laughs> um, so that we could you know, continue these discussions without tripping over whether or not the central contradictions include, as they must, the contradictions of mass incarceration, of precarious labor, of houselessness, of gender violence, of all of the things we've been talking about. Right. That this is all one thing, right? This is why this conference is called Change Everything. But we change it by changing the already existing organizations we work through, as well as forming new organizations. Because if consciousness is the means through which we imagine ourselves in the, into the future, organizations are the form. Like, we have to have form, or we can't get there. liberalism, or as you were just discussing, also certain forms of Marxism, obscure about the relationship between the economic versus the political and social features of capitalism, which is maybe a fancy way of saying, what does it obscure about the relationship between race and class, or between exploitation, expropriation, mm -hmm. and repression? Why is it that this is so hard for many people whether liberal or on the left, mm -hmm. to get right. Man, I wish I knew, because it seems so easy to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm actually serious. I don't, I re, I, I, I'm, I'm not being falsely modest when I say I don't understand why it's so hard to understand that, well, let me quote an old rallying cry, an injury to one is an injury to all. It's not an injury to a few is an injury <laughs> to the others who count. Mm -hmm. It's one is all. Um, so liberalism is what it is because the, um, the kinds of activities that in some are the workings of the economy are for liberalism the foundation of all that is good in the world. Right? So of course liberalism cannot see that the freedom that capitalism enables, the particular kind of freedom that capitalism enables, is not in and of itself a universalizing force. They believe it is. <laughs> they like totally know it is. They've written books about it. It's like an entire philosophy, is there not? Like when they're not talking about the donuts, they're talking about this. <laughs> Right, so I'm not all that surprised about liberalism, capital L liberalism, because it's, you know, it's a really coherent religion. Mm -hmm. It's an incredibly coherent religion. And its coherence depends on uh, ignoring and calling outliers everything that doesn't work according to its theologies, right? That, that they're, these are just the people outside. Oh, here, I'm gonna go really far back in time and, and space to make a point. Herman Bennett, you know who he is? Yes. Fantastic Herman. historian, yeah. fantastic historian. He writes about medieval and early modern African history. He's a genius, and colonial history. Mm. Um, he wrote a book a few, that he published a few years ago called um, African Kings and Black Slaves. His argument in the book, which is really profound, is that uh, as against the view that many of us who came up through black studies and ethnic studies take of the, the origin and development of the African slave trade, 
that a bunch of Europeans got in some boats, you know, chugged down to West and West Central Africa, grabbed some people off the shore, chugged across the Atlantic and started plantations. He goes, well, you know, maybe there's something else going on that gives us some insights into the origin and development of European political theory and theories of sovereignty. So let's look again at what was happening when these cats got in the boats and chugged down to West and West Central Africa and started trying to figure out who the sovereigns were who could authorize them first to take gold and then to take humans. And that in that interaction, we get at once the rise and development of what became liberal political theory and the production of those who are outside the order, those who, as Herman puts it, were conscripted into slavery, right? So sovereignty, no sovereignty, change over time. So liberalism doesn't confuse me, it shouldn't confuse anybody. <laughs> Lefties though, I don't get it. Like why is a particularly narrowly defined notion of the point of production so blinding that they can't see and can't read what people have written and written and rewritten and rewritten and rewritten in a variety of traditions around the world to show that that point of production is meaningless without the entire constellation of social relations that make any activity at that point of production possible. Robin, this has me thinking a lot about Hammer and Hope. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you, can't, you can't ask me a question now? I mean, you, you, have, you, have, to, you have to sit with that for a second. You really have to sit with that. Because exactly, that's brilliant. You know, and, and it's interesting that I feel like you've said this before. You've been saying this for 20 plus, 30 years. And you would think by now, we would have, like all of us, a kind of clear understanding of liberalism and a clear understanding of the limits of the way Marxism is mobilized. Um, and you know, the, and the interesting thing is the, the, the fact that there were these debates that took place throughout the 20th century about the point of production versus you know, someplace else. That is, uh, someplace else often community or neighborhood. And you've answered all the questions that I think everyone needs to know so you can go and do your work. Well, let me ask you a more specific follow-up question. How does, has the debate or set of confusions that pass for a debate sometimes about kind of race and class and all of that in the last decade or two compared to what you saw in, say, the 1930s? Right, well, um, the short version is that you could, is the hammer and hose available? <laughs> um, <laughs> but but to answer your question, Dan, which is a, a good one, you know, I, I sort of I feel like you know I feel like the way Ruthie felt about this when I started writing about the Communist Party, um, and it, in fact, it was originally South Africa, and I, the reason I ended up not writing about South Africa is I couldn't get into the country in 1986, <laughs> um, and for you know for good reason. I don't know if you know what was happening there. Um, but in many ways, I, I never ever saw, and my mentors never ever saw, um, a conflict. In other words, there wasn't an opposition between race and class. They were mutually constitutive. Even if the, the folks who worked in San Pedro didn't use that term, they understood it because they lived it. Um, and so looking at the Communist Party in Alabama, it's very clear that um, the black working class was a working class and they were black. And so they dealt with things, um, forms of oppression and marginalization, but also forms of community that made it possible for them to build a movement that was always inclusive. The problem, and just very simply, um, if, you go back to, to, if you go back and read Black Marxism, and if you read, uh, it's the section in Part one, where he talks about social, where, where he talks about sort of social, socialist theory, and nationalism, and the limits of Marx and Engels' notion of, of socialist theory because of nationalism. One of the points he actually makes is a, in the conclusion of that section 
he says, he doesn't use the term race, racial reductionism, but he says, you know, the problem with our understanding through Marx is that race, racialism, shaped the way in which Marxists of the 19th century and early 20th century understood class. So he's saying the original racial reductionism is in, in Marx. Not Marx per se, but in Marx in the way that the fact that, that Marx and Engels could not escape the fact that they lived in a society that was already racial. And he's saying that crimes began before there were black people on the scene. The crimes began within Europe itself. That is, if you create hierarchies of difference that are based on these imagined mm -hmm. sort of notion of what the hair invoked is, you know, then that's what you get. You get a sense of, of where you can't separate race and class, but especially where you can't see class operations because of race. And we flipped it. We, we keep saying that all those movements that are coming out that are not claiming to be class movements, they're not claiming to be universal, are the ones that are, are engaged in race reductionism. When it's like, it's the, it's the original um, sin was back then, you know, understanding the way in which Europe shaped socialist theory, and then we could actually move past it mm -hmm. as long as we're able to engage it. Yeah, I don't find I don't find the liberal the liberals position on race and class hard to understand for the reasons Ruthie explained. Um, I do find the kind of refusal by some Marxists um, to let those play nice together. Um, I do find that hard to understand, mostly because, you know, I, I feel like I learned a lot of how I think about race and capitalism and the global flow of capitalism from Marx. Um, and I'm, I'm breaking one of my normal rules, which is to talk about interpretations of 19th century German political thought. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are. Uh, but, you know, I mean, in, in that first few decades or so, there were very explicit debates between Marx's contemporaries and, you know, even the, you know, first couple generations of the Russian Marxists, Lakhanov and Lenin and Trotsky and all them, about the difference that very contingent things made, right? You know, what's Kaiser Wilhelm going to do? Like, that's not built into the laws of motion of capital, <laughs> but, it, but whether or not we survive this revolutionary struggle depends on the answer to this very contingent question about what's going on over there. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was going on over there, and that was very explicitly acknowledged, again, by all these old guard Marxists, was the Berlin Conference of 1884 and the division of the African continent into basically zones of economic exploitation by European colonial powers. And people had debates about exactly what to think about that and what to do about that, but nobody thought that was irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And zoom forward a few, you know, a few decades, a few generations, and people are like, well, maybe it's just, you know, Adam's void and class struggle and nothing else, you know, there's no, you, all you do is count where profit's going and you don't need to think about other social categories or something like that. You know, I, I, and I, earlier, when I started talking, I said the refusal of some people to talk about race and class, and I think that's been, um, I think that has been the position I've come to. It really just is a refusal. There's no position there. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just a refusal. Right. Um, I just, I'm reminded, I have, I have to, I have to call him out. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, a couple years ago, Michael Walter wrote uh, a piece on racial capitalism, and it starts by being like, I don't know what this phrase means, but, <laughs> but here's how I feel about it. <laughs> Which is never how you want to start a debate, but you know. <laughs> Can I Google that for you, <laughs> Professor Walter? <laughs> yeah, and you know, he's a contemporary of Cedric Robinson's, right. who wrote Black Marxism and is one of the 
um, people that uses the phrase racial capitalism. He's a contemporary of the African anti-colonial theorist who came up with this in South Africa and Zimbabwe and um, Ibadan and Nigeria, you know, the people who were doing this theory in the 60s and 70s. And I was just like, oh, they just didn't read it. Oh, right. that's fine. <laughs> right. Like, your piece is brilliant on this, by, by yeah, the way. Yeah, it is. It's really it is. brilliant. Thank you. But, you know, and I, I just, the, the last thing I'll say in closing is just, you know, if people don't want to talk about it, they don't have to talk about it. You know, it's a, I was going to say it's a free country. That's a free country. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong crowd. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, nobody's saying you know, nobody's holding a gun to your head and be like, you must read Cedric Robinson. You know, but I, I think we can, you know, those of us who are interested in thinking about how these things are connected can can just go about doing that. We don't have to pretend like there's some serious intellectual position somewhere that's explaining why we shouldn't. Could I add something here? Um, I'm with you. If somebody doesn't want to talk about, engage with these ideas, engage with people who are, are working on the ground, that's fine. But if that's what their position is, then they really need to shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm, I'm remarkably irritated. <laughs> by so many wags who publish in journals like Jacobin, which might publish a transcript of this con conversation, and elsewhere, who make shit up about abolition and then tear it down. Mm -hmm. They invent antecedents. They attribute arguments to people who never made any kind of argument of that sort. They can't tell black women apart. <laughs> I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. And they can just shut up. Do whatever else they're going to do. Um, but I want to say something about Marx also. I used to teach Marx every year. I like teaching Capital Volume 1. It's a lot of fun to teach. And what we do is read Capital Volume 1 one semester and then read Black Marxism. It was like back to back. It was great. A lot of fun. You would never know the way some of these people carry on, these people being the people who can't tell black women apart, et cetera, et cetera, that most of the Marxists on the planet are not white, they're not men, and they're not in the global north. And when you read, actually read, that book, Capital Volume One, and then the subsequent books, and then all the other stuff, because that cat was like busy. <laughs> that cat was busy. Robin once called him the nappy headed philosopher. <laughs> he was Mar Marx, not Cedric. Yeah. <laughs> Cedric's hair was kind of nappy, right, too, right, though. Right. <laughs> but anyway, but if you read Capital Volume One and read it as though you're reading, a 19th century English novel, mm -hmm. you will have a better read than if you sit down reading it for the blueprint of what to do. Right. Right. It tells you a story with all of these dynamics and characters, and you can not only see what's happening in the dialectical analysis of the commodity form and the industrial mode of production, but also you can see in the pages the rise of certain kinds of um, uh, institutional and other forms mm -hmm. that actually Charlie didn't discuss in the book, but he's pointing and saying, you should pay attention to this too. So when he says in passing, and therefore the working men blah, blah, blah organized, and um, in such and such a year, a law was passed against child labor or against women working in certain hours in factories. That tells you something quite important about the struggle and the structure over the, ca the capitalist mode of production, the possible power of workers, how the state, the capitalist state came into being, and how it changes. It's all there. Mm -hmm. It just isn't all laid out paragraph by paragraph. And uh, to come forward a few decades from um, the 
the scramble for Africa um, to the common turn, uh, uh, the common turn. Um, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote Robin, say, who was th said in, in a talk he gave, oh, one of the study groups, mm -hmm. maybe Labor, Labor Community Strategy Center study summer session mm -hmm. you taught. Mm -hmm. We all do study groups, by the way, and if you all are in a study group, get in a study group. You should be in study groups always. But anyway, um, Robin talked about the common turn, everybody getting together, and of course, you know, Lennon and them were kind of flush with victory, and I still think it's the greatest thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the toilers of the East came, and I think it was M.N. Roy, yeah, you know, yeah. M.N. Roy got up and, I quote Robin, look, Lennon, says <laughs> M.N. Roy, <laughs> there's this and this and this. So, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, whatever people in the 21st century think, the origin and development of, capital, of, of communism, anti-capitalism and communism is, is different. And if they can't think about and talk about and write about race and class again, I'm going to say they need to STFU. Mm -hmm. They're missing it. Mm -hmm. Robin, we, we were emailing a, a few days ago and you wrote that quote, the days of party cadre seem over. And that, at least for now, definitely seems to be true. But, but Mike Davis, who we've all been thinking about a lot recently, he's not alone in calling for a new organization of organizers. What, what were the shortcomings of the era of cadre organization? And, and what, by contrast, are we missing in their absence? Um. I think Ruthie should take that one. And you, we only have two minutes. Yeah. Do you think I should take it? Well, yeah, yeah. We might go I, over, I think we might go over two or three minutes. I think, I think we're actually in a new era of cadre organization. Um, and the cadres, what I call last night the Soviets, are not um, necessarily in communist or socialist parties, but they are really serious organizers mm -hmm. who, are, who are not only fighting to make something where they're at, but developing relations across um, uh, various struggles in order to be in solidarity, not alliance, solidarity with others. My ex the example I use over and over again is the MST. It's not the only one, but it's a really strong one. And I think that um, the best way to think about what the MST does is, as a social movement, doing land occupations, uh, developing agriculture, doing uh, building occupations in Sao Paulo and Rio so that long distance migrants don't get caught up in the US criminalization um, outsourcing regime. Uh, and uh, working with uh, people in southern Africa to figure out how quote unquote shack dwellers can make the land around where they're living um, flourish agriculturally and people in, I guess that's our deadline, huh? Um, people in Indonesia and elsewhere who are trying to shift from monocropping to uh, sustainable agriculture is an example of cadre work. In the United States, people who are working in a number of different um, uh, formations fighting for um, abolition, for workers' rights, and so forth are something pretty close to cadre. And while it might be that I'm being a little slippery in using the word to describe people who would not then self-describe thus, um, we should take seriously the possible sturdiness of what they're doing mm -hmm. and the focus and creative aggression that, that motivates them. And again, think about how to build those organizations through the, the energy that we have gathered in these rooms and elsewhere. So I think Cadre might be back. Frankly. Yeah. But, it's, but I would add that it's, it's, it's Cadre without democratic centralism, mm -hmm. you know, which I think is actually, meaning for those of you who may not know, heard that term before, democratic centralism is like you have the line, once the line is, 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 is determined, you follow that line. And I feel like what you what you've described is something um, that's definitely like cadre organization, but mm -hmm. more democratic in the sense that it looks more like an organization of organizers, mm -hmm. you know, MST, you know, mm -hmm. building power and people having 
the capacity to build power and do the work they need to do without necessarily having to be um, told you're not following the line so that you can be expelled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, because people get expelled in a cadre organization in a way that I think this other generation, it's a little bit different. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I don't have too much to add, um, but maybe just a plus one to, you know, can we have ways of having ongoing principal disagreement as opposed mm -hmm. to the kind of party discipline that's um, associated with democratic centralism. I think that's an open question. Um, we don't have the organization to even ask it at this point, but if we were going to build one, I think that would be question number one. So maybe it's, it's a good point to leave on. Well, Demi Taiwo, Robin Kelly, and Ruth Wilson Gilmore, thank you all very, very much. Thank you all very much. There's a uh, there's a dig listener sure happy know. hour now. I think outside all the time. at the bar, the hotel bar outside. I love that book. It's, isn't it amazing? It is mind blowing. Like he was already like the smartest person. Yeah. Have you read this? It's, it's really